Hey there, I'm John Favreau. I'm Tommy Vitor. The Pod Save America team is on holiday break, so today we're bringing you a special sneak peek of our new subscriber podcast, Inside 2024. Just one more thing to be thankful for. On a holiday. <laughs> Hello, on a holiday. Each monthly episode of Inside 2024 will feature a rotating cast of former White House staffers spilling their campaign trail stories and insights as we look ahead to the 2024 election cycle. In this episode, John and I will take you through one of the most stressful, dramatic, sometimes terrible days of the year, Election Day. What you're about to hear is just part of the episode. The whole episode and future episodes of Inside 2024 are available to our Friends of the Pod community. If you're interested in getting access to more great Crooked content, head over to crooked.com slash friends to learn more and sign up. Enjoy. I want to start today at the end and mm -hmm. talk about Election Day. And I thought that was a really great place to start because, you know, this show is going to get into the nitty gritty of what it's like to be on a campaign. But I feel like our listeners and honestly, we need to be reminded of what's at stake, what we're fighting for, and remember the like amazing glory it is to win mm -hmm. and the gut-wrenching feeling of losing. Mm -hmm. When I mentioned this topic to you guys, you both had like very skeptic, nervous, stressed out feelings about it. So hmm. when you hear about election day, yeah. what, do you, what are the emotions that stir up for both of you? Well, the thing about election days that are that is weird for people who do what we did, which is communications work, is that there's nothing to do. You just sit around and you stress out and you read exit polls and you follow the news and you vote. But like mostly you're just hurry up and waiting. Now, it's different for the field team because they're out. They're doing a huge GOTV effort. They're knocking on doors. You asked what election day is like and the f anxiety is the first word that comes to mind. In fact like so much anxiety that you just saying election day, like I had the feeling again <laughs> of like, oh shit, it's here. Because there's, first of all, there's nothing to do on election day. Like I said, if you, if you do the work that we do. And so you're just like, but you have to go to work and you're sitting around and it's like, everyone's asking everyone else, uh, you hearing anything? You hearing anything? Mm -hmm. You got any reports? How about early vote reports? How about uh, how about reports from early voting in precincts? And this point, it just goes on and on and on and on all day. The first exit polls were released just a short time ago. The initial survey shows the electorate is older and there are more white voters heading to the polls compared to the midterms of 2018. Right. These early exit poll results are based on voter interviews before Election Day as well as on Election Day to get a comprehensive look at this year's electorate. So, so if you're in the White House and you're watching this, numbers right now, uh, what does it tell you and what do you do? Yeah, well, Jake, first I just want to say these are preliminary initial exit poll results. These are surveys uh, that we've done of voters who voted on election day as well as uh, the tens of millions of voters uh, who voted prior to election day. This is a representative sample of the overall electorate. So they were telling some brutal numbers for President Biden right there, Dan, and I have to say. And like none of the information is super helpful or or very illuminating about like what the final tally is because not everyone has fucking voted yet but uh it does not stop you from asking people what you've heard josh ernest said that uh looking at exit polls is like hooking up with your ex you know you shouldn't do it you do it anyway you feel terrible afterwards and it's just sort of like this awful ritual that you're doomed to repeat on election day what is like a day in the life like you're waking up where obviously what if you're like i was asleep the whole time um where <laughs> honestly are... that would have been preferable <laughs> where are the staffers where is the candidate so you said in 2008 you guys were in chicago mm -hmm. that's where obama was too but were you guys in the office with him for the full day we were in the office Tommy and I were in the office. He was not in the office. He well, he voted. Yeah, he was home and then he voted. <laughs> Did he, didn't Bill Ayers that? come to yeah, his? He, he, so this is what is the funniest story. So Jen Psaki is with the press pool. They're all waiting to watch Obama go in and vote. This guy named Bill Ayers shows up. Bill Ayers was a huge point of controversy in this election because he was part of an organization called the Weather Underground back in the day. We have a great podcast here at Crooked Media called uh, Mother Country Radicals that's about this. Domestic terrorist group. Yeah. <laughs> Blew shit up, right? And they had a relationship. For the greater good. For the greater <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, <laughs> Debatable. So anyway, uh, <laughs> moving forward. So they, they, <laughs> they knew each other back in the day. They like were socially friends at the University of Chicago. Some might say they were palling around. Yeah, palling around mm -hmm. terrorists, as Sarah Palin fam famously said. So he shows up, and that was like the big brouhaha of the day is Saki emailing and being like, well, funny story, Bill Ayers, Bill Ayers is here. Was that an accident? 
Oh yeah. 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 Oh shit. Yeah. We, I, as far as I remember, just like sat in that office and were just like refreshing from, news websites from like, so, like 5 a.m. until they I called we, it. So you're saying you're mostly doing nothing except mm-hmm. for reading exit polls that may or may not confirm what you don't or don't want to hear. Correct. Mm-hmm. So you're gossiping. <laughs> you're, you're just doing. gossiping. Yeah. That's a much better analogy. Yeah. It's just gossiping, just chit- which head. sounds honestly very fun. So okay, Fabs, you were speechwriter. Mm-hmm. Where in the timeline have you written a concession or what's the other word? Oh no, victory speech. Victory I'm like, speech. we had three speeches. You have three. What's the other one? I don't uh, know. Too close. Inconclusive. Yeah, inconclusive. Too oh, close. Um, I didn't forget you guys did that. That yeah. sucks. Yeah. There's a lot of. Um, did you ever watch Veep? Yes. You know, uh, Selena Meyer's best friend who's like, well, that's a good question. I mean, I can see how it can go one way, but what if it went the other way? Do you remember her? <laughs> yes. Rebecca? <laughs> she was so annoying. Um, and, and that's what a, I imagine. And really models speeches. like a candidate friend quite well, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> um, so are there any times during that day where you're editing speeches based off of what's happening? How does that process work? Are you on the phone with Obama? Are you working with your your team like yeah. how does that work so maybe a week before election day we started to write the drafts of the election night speeches now you guys may argue with me on this but I, again i'm just trying to give a little bit of a i want this to be populous but i want a little bit of a flavor of forward looking so and um the way it went was i took the lead on the victory speech um I think Sarah Hurwitz wrote, uh, who was one of our speechwriters, she had been Hillary Clinton's speechwriter, then we hired her, and then she came with us to the White House and became Michelle Obama's speechwriter, she's a fantastic speechwriter. Um, she took the lead on the uh, concession speech. I forget who did the too close to call speech, but that was similar to the- Is that just a short one? It was a very short one, mm-hmm. yeah. It was like, we're excited about the results, we still gotta wait for all the votes to be counted, we'll talk yeah, to you yeah. tomorrow kind of thing. Um, and so we had all the speeches done. I'd sent Obama had them like days before the election, on election day. But he was like, I don't want to edit. I don't want to jinx anything. Mm-hmm. And I'm like too nervous. Everyone's to, so superstitious. Everyone's so superstitious. Yeah. Yeah. So no one gave us edits. So I, Obama did not give me edits to the victory speech until it seemed like we won Ohio and, and he won the presidency. And then he called with uh, just a couple edits. I can't believe it. <laughs> It's unbelievable. It looks really good. You feeling good? <laughs> right now it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Oh, and one paragraph up, Axe had one edit. Uh, when it says there will be setbacks and false starts, uh, he has, there are many who won't agree. Um, uh, with every decision or policy I make as president, and we know that government can't solve every problem. Okay. Okay. Who gets say over that speech? And why did I see you change the word that to those? <laughs> <laughs> Are those the important edits you're doing? Yeah. Well, he, Obama would make sort of nitpicky edits like that just because he's a writer. Mm-hmm. And so he got into that kind of stuff. The only, I think I sent that, I mean, I said it around to everyone. The people who would really make edits, the most edits were Axelrod, David Axelrod, uh, who's our chief strategist. And once in a while, Robert Gibbs would make an edit. David Pluff, the campaign manager, would make an edit. But really, no one else dug in. It, unless it was a policy speech. That was not a policy speech. So mm-hmm. um, that was just, uh, most of that was just me and him. Do you remember any like specific part of that? That was a victory speech. But is there a specific part you remember that you like really loved or yeah, was so your idea? I, well, but a couple of days before, when I was trying to figure out an ending to the speech, I read a CNN story about um, this woman named Ann Nixon Cooper who had waited in in line in Atlanta to vote for three hours, and which is crazy that she had to wait three hours to vote. But also, it was notable because she was 105 years old. This election had many firsts and many stories that will be told for generations. But one that's on my mind tonight is about a woman who cast her ballot in Atlanta. She is a lot like the millions of others who stood in line to make their voice heard in this election, except for one thing. Ann Nixon Cooper is 106 years old. I think this is a great way to end the speech, to talk about like when she was born, 
right? She couldn't vote because she was black and because she was a woman. She was born just a generation past slavery, a time when there were no cars on the road or planes in the sky, when someone like her couldn't vote for two reasons, because she was a woman and because of the color of her skin. And then, like, all the things she'd seen in the century that she was an American, all the progress she'd seen. And tonight, I think about all that she's seen throughout her century in America, the heartache and the hope, the struggle and the progress. And so we figured that's how we'd end the speech. And then after talking about all the things she'd seen, we'd do the yes, we can refrain. And this year, in this election, she touched her finger to a screen and cast her vote. Because after 106 years in America, through the best of times and the darkest of hours, she knows how America can change. Yes, we can. So um, wrote this whole thing. He called me, like we just saw in that clip. And as soon as I hung up, Tommy, who was right next to me, was like, oh, we should, you should like call in Nixon Cooper and like let this woman know that she's going to be in this speech. And so it was like, oh, right. I didn't even think about that. And so we had our researchers like find, locate her, find her number. And so I called her and um, she's like a very frail woman picks up the phone and I was like, hi. And I like explained to her who I was <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and Senator Obama's going to mention you in the speech and because he's really moved by her story. And she's like, uh, is it going to be on TV? And I was like, oh yeah, it's going to be on TV. And then she was like, she stopped and she thought, and she was like, uh, what channel is it going to be on? And I was like, it's going to be on all the channels. <laughs> and, um, and then she stopped and she was like, uh, I'm so happy. I'm so proud. And uh, and it was like right at that moment that they called the race. 11 p.m. on the East Coast, and we have news. Barack Obama will be the 44th president of the United States. And so everyone's like cheering and yelling and clapping. And I was like, under the desk trying to like talk to Ann Nixon Cooper before he went and did it. It was really, it was a cool moment. That's it's so kind sweet. of like emotional to think about all this shit, you know? Yeah, I know. It's, it's a very, long time ago, but. I always, it's a, it was an emotional moment. I mean, I wasn't even there and I felt like I wanted, I wish I was there. Like it just felt really emotional and special. Talking a little bit more about like the day. Tommy, I know mm -hmm. you worked a lot with the press. So mm -hmm. like what's on that day? Like what's the relationship like between the campaign and this press? How much are you guys speaking to each other? How much are you kind of, leaking yeah. temperament in the headquarters? What does that look like? Well, so my job I, in Iowa, I was the Iowa press secretary, and then they said, come back to Chicago headquarters. We're about to beat Hillary. We need you to do rapid response against John McCain. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> what, like four or five months later, we're still campaigning against Hillary. Eventually, we win the primary, so then I become a rapid response person, and my job was, like, go after the McCain campaign all day, every day. That's just a way of saying, like, my job was kind of done in terms of press, so I'm just gossiping with people. I'm just <laughs> trading information, right? There is a pool of reporters that follow Obama around wherever he goes. Jen Psaki was usually with them. So she's like in a van with them, following his movements, and then hanging out. We found this one clip of you, and I believe this is when you're working in Iowa. It's you and a reporter, and uh, I, I, always, I, remember this. I always had uh, an idea that, like, there was a very formal relationship between campaign people and reporters, no. and the chumminess is was very shocking. Oh, so, Tommy Vitor? Yeah, Scott Elmwood from the Boston Globe. Hey, man. How are you? I've been reading you forever. I've been, you know, swearing about Boston sports. I'm fun. Back Way to stick it to us on that that crap lobbying story. Yeah, I knew you wouldn't like that. That's such bullshit. When are we gonna move past the gotcha story? Oh, come on. That was. Can't. Really here, here's here's they just say what a good story. spokesman. Tommy was and that like highlighted it that clip he like goes up to Scott Coleman he's like super friendly ah oh, from Boston Rita River what the fuck is that story <laughs> blah 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 and then grabs the candidate and brings him to the local Iowa uh, like fucking Dave was Price it? yeah what was the counting contest what was the it? Like, uh, Colonel oh the Colonel Corn. counting contest yeah brings him over to the Colonel con contest to get the like local hit in Iowa which is way more important than whatever the Boston Globe <laughs> that was the only <laughs> thing I cared about yeah my job was like what does the Iowa press need and how can I beg borrow and steal to get it so we're at the polls are closing everything's too close to call 
what are you guys doing? But most importantly, what are you drinking? Thanks for checking out our special sneak peek of Inside 2024. To hear the rest of this episode and future episodes, plus a ton of other great exclusive content, consider joining the Friends of the Pod subscriber community. Go to crooked.com slash friends to learn more.